our guests, again, just welcome home. Um, we're going to start a brand new series today that I am super, super excited about. And I've honestly um, been in prayer for this series for quite a while. And I just want to set it up for you a little bit because I really feel like we're at a very pivotal moment in the life of our church. And what I mean by that is, like I said, we just celebrated two years of being here in Hampton. Um, we've now been a church for a little over a year now. And, and as you know, whenever you start anything, and, and if you want to use the analogy of farming, you know, whenever the farming season begins, there's a lot of plowing the ground. And plowing the ground takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of fuel. And you, the goal of, of plowing the ground is so you get the seeds in the ground. And, and once those seeds are in the ground, you really want, now the goal is to, to, to really nurture those seeds. Help those seeds take root and grow and grow up into the plant that, that it can become. And, and it's fun to talk about that with farming because it's really easy. And you can drive by a field and you can see what the field looks like. You can see how tall the corn's getting or how tall it's not getting. It's not so easy with people. <laughs> and it's not so easy in a church because people don't follow the same schedule all the time. Our spiritual development can go in different seasons and different times. And we can have great, tremendous season of great growth and great health. And then that can be followed by times of tremendous drought and tremendous sorrow and tremendous pain. And, and I really think, like I said, in the life of this church, we're in a very pivotal point where we can really go from, from planting those seeds and plowing the ground to really start to spring up and, and to grow and to become the people that God desires us to be and to become the church that God desires us to be. And one of the great pleasures that I get as your pastor <coughs> is I get to spend time with you amazing people. And, and I get to really sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and talk about how things are going and what's going on in your world and how we can better serve you as a church. And I love those conversations and I value those times. And, and I really truly mean this. I love being your pastor. And it's so much fun to see all the things that God has done. But friends, I know that God has so much more for us. And so this series, we're calling it The Elephant. And, and what we're talking about here is we all have things in our lives that we don't really like to talk about. We, we, we kind of would rather avoid. We kind of just like to leave it alone. And we've turned that as the elephant in the room, as you can see from our slide. And the problem with elephants in the room is not only do they get in the way, not only do they kind of inhibit our relationships, they really impact our, 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 our opportunity to serve God with all our heart and, and, and the ways that which God really wants to use us in our lives. And, and unfortunately, I think sometimes we think we're being polite or being kind when we kind of step around the elephant because everyone knows it's there. You ever been in those rooms where you know there's an elephant in the room and everyone in the room knows it's there and no one wants to address it? Well, this series, the reason why we're calling it the elephant is because we're going to talk about it. We're going to address the ele some elephants in our room. And as a Christian, I firmly believe, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we are not called just to address elephants. We're called to smash them. <laughs> we're called to get rid of them. We're called to get them out of the room. Let's, let's clear them out. It might be uncomfortable. It might be a little awkward. But it's absolutely 100% critical. So if you got your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And while you're going there, um, this will be up on the screen. It'll also be in your notes. Um, this was written by the Apostle Paul over 2,000 years ago. And I don't want you to miss that part. Because I'm going to read through this passage. And as I read through it, what I'd like you to do, I want some crowd participation. This is going to be an all play. All right? So as I read this, I'm going to read about the list of characteristics that Paul is going to show. And any time that I say something that you think is present in our world today and could be an elephant, I want you guys to yell out, elephant. All right, we're gonna identify some elephants that Paul listed here, okay? So I'm in chapter three, verse one, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. There you go, you got it. Lovers of money. Boastful. Proud. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. I heard some kids on that one. Ungrateful. Ungodly. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. Without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of good. Treacherous. Rash. Conceited. And this one here. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
huge. And then this last one. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. We have a lot of elephants, don't we? In our world today, when we look around at these. And again, this was written 2,000 years ago. You know, something that's amazed me in my two years of being here in Yankton, and, and I really, I thought about this before I, or before I said it here, I really had to reflect on it, and I truly, honestly believe that I have yet to meet an atheist here in Yankton. And, and that's amazing to me, because I, I, I have yet to meet someone who says, nope, there's no God, I don't believe in God. I don't know that I've met somebody yet. I've really tried to think about that, and I don't think. So what's interesting about that, and that shows in our culture, Survey after survey will say, most people believe in a God. Most people would believe in a higher power. Most people think that that's important in your life. Now, if, I, if there is an atheist here, I'd love to meet you. <laughs> and, and, and I'd love to connect with them. But that's what I think. But the problem is, what I think it is, is we have a view of God that I think isn't quite complete. See, here's the kind of God we want. We want just enough God to, keep, to get us into heaven. Right? We want, want our ticket punched to that. We want just enough God to keep us out of hell. Okay, just don't, don't want to go there. And, but we don't want enough God that it actually has to make a difference in my life. See, I want to continue to live my life the way that I want to live my life. And I don't want God coming in and telling me what to do. I, again, just enough God to get me to heaven. Just enough God to keep me out of hell. But yet, not enough God to make an impact in my life. And just that last part in 2 Timothy, have a form of godliness, but denying its power. See, I think people believe in God, they just don't really get God. And so the first elephant we're going to talk about today, and we're, if, in your notes there, we're going to write down, it's called a reality check. Reality check means we're going to smash an elephant. And we're going to look at what's in the world. Do you really know God? And, and I mean, do you really know God? And we're going to walk through that today. And now, while we're doing that, I want to ask you a question. How many of you in here like buffets? Any buffet fans in the house? A few of them. Okay, I love buffets. Yankton, man, we've got so many great buffets, right? Joe Dean's. It's like world famous. Joe Dean's, you say Joe Dean's, it's like a fancy buffet. It's awesome, right? We have Pizza Ranch. Any Pizza Ranch fans in the house? A few. Okay, great buffet. I love buffets, right? My personal favorite, and no one in my family will go there, so if you want to take me there sometime, you'll be my best friend. The King Buffet, right? The Mongolian King Buffet, you guys been there before? Yeah, all right, my people back there, we're gonna go on a day and time. I love buffets. You know, we go in buffets, and one of the reasons why we love buffets is because we can get whatever we want. And we get however much of it that we want, right? I can go through and I can take a little of this, a little of that. I don't really like that, so I'll leave that there. I'll take some more of this. I'll go sit down. I'll try something. I don't really like that, so I'll just leave it on my plate. I'll eat some more stuff. Then I'll go back again to the buffet, and I'll, oh, I really want this. I need to get some of that. I'll try some of that. That's why we love buffets, because we love to be in control. And here's where I'm going with it. I think that's our view of God. We want to have a buffet God. Oh, I like this little part of God. Yeah, I'll take this little part of God. Oh, I don't really like that part of God. I'll just leave that part there. Or, or oh, this looks really good. I'll take this part. But then you try it. You're like, ah, that really doesn't settle with my stomach. I'll just leave that over there. I can take this and that. And we have a buffet God. And the reason why I think we have a buffet view of God is because we don't really understand God. We don't really get God. We don't really know God. See, God is perfect and God is holy. His word is my authority in my life. His word doesn't change. Did you know that? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can't have a buffet view of God. We've got to, we can't pick and choose. We've got to take God for what he says. So in Psalm chapter 36, verse 1, I see this all the time in our world today. Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their heart. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they are. And the word, the two words that really struck me in that passage were the word sin whispers. I see that all the time. Here are some things that sin whispers. Go ahead. You deserve it. Live a little. Don't miss all the fun. It's not like you're an addict or anything. Well, sure, you're married, but your wife will never find out. Well, of course you guys aren't married yet, but it's okay. You really love her. Look around. You're not that bad. You're not as bad as that guy. I mean, it's not like you killed anybody. Remember, he's a God of forgiveness. 
He's not going to send you to hell with this. And sin whispers over and over and over again in our lives. And the reason why sin can get by with whispering, and I believe this with all my heart, the reason why sin can get by in your life by whispering is because we don't really know God. Because if we really knew God and we really understood Him, those whispers would go away. We would see God. The problem that we have, and, and I think it's, it's true, is we have what we call comparison righteousness. I am always comparing myself to, to someone else. I look at somebody and say, well, I'm not as bad as them. This person is like really bad. All right, this, they're doing this stuff. I am way better than them. Now, I'm not as good as this person over here, right? This person, you know, they go to church and they, you know, read their Bible and all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not even close to being them, but I'm kind of more in the middle. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as good as them, but I'm definitely not as bad as them. And comparison righteousness is not a test at all. We all fail at comparison because here's the thing. We hold our standard as Jesus Christ. And his standard is perfection. And guess what? We all fail. Every single one of us. We cannot compare ourselves with each other. We have to compare ourselves to God. And, and, and once we truly do that and understand that, once we really know God, those sins go away. And, and we can see them more effectively. So get in your notes. I want to help you out with that. There's three levels of knowing somebody. Now, this isn't rocket science. This is not, this is, you guys will figure this out. But there's really three levels of knowing someone. The first level is I've heard about them. Okay? You've heard about them. These could be like a famous person, right? You, you've heard about them. Maybe they're a movie star. Maybe there's an athlete. You've heard about them. Maybe it's somebody in the community. Maybe you've heard about like a politician or a business owner. I've heard about them, but I've never met them. I don't really know them. Here's the second level of knowing somebody. You know about them. Okay? So maybe you've met them. Maybe you, you, you've introduced yourself. Maybe you know like who their wife is or their kids are or what car they drive, where they work. Know things about them. And again, with like famous people, maybe you haven't met them, but you understand like where they grew up and what they do for a living and where they live. You kind of know about them. But there's a third level of knowing somebody is where you really know them. And I'm talking an intimate, deep knowledge of them. Like, you know the name of their dog. You know, I, I feel like if I know if I know somebody's dog, I really know that person. <laughs> I've been to their house, I know them, right? That's kind of a deep level of knowing them. If, if you know stuff, and again, I talked about this earlier, but I said, where you've had a chance to sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and really hear their story. Because here's the thing, once you start to understand someone's story, where they've come from, you really start to understand that person, don't you? You start to see them in a completely different light. I remember when I used to work with kids um, who were extreme behavioral challenges, like awful behavior stuff that I can't even begin to describe to you. And, and you'd see this angry little child, you know, and, and they're so angry. And you're just like, where does that anger come from? And then you'd have those moments where they would share the horrific abuse and neglect at the hands of people who were supposed to love and care for them. And they couldn't reconcile that in their minds. And so now this anger comes out. And a lot of times as a staff member, they would take that anger out on me because I was a safe person. See, they knew I wouldn't, I wouldn't hit them. They knew I wouldn't demean them or belittle them. So all that anger and all that hurt they had, they took it out on me. And I had to be very, very careful not to take that personal. And it's hard to do when you're in that moment. But when you understand somebody, you know them at a deep, intimate level, it changes the way that you deal with them. And we want to understand it. So I want to ask you a question. Look at those three levels of know. Where are you at with God? Have you just heard about God? And again, I would quantify that as the people that I said, how I haven't met any atheists in the end. They know about God. Yeah, I know about God. I know about Jesus. I've been to church. I understand that. Maybe, maybe you know, know about them. You know, like I said, maybe you understand the Bible. You've read it. You've been to Sunday school. You know, my parents were Christians, blah, blah, blah. But do you really know God? Do you really know him at a deep, intimate level? Because that's what God wants to know about you. He wants to know you at a deep and intimate level. And friends, when you do that, it will change everything about your life. Now, I'm going to take what's going to feel like a little bit of a left turn, all right? But I want you to stay with me because this is going to be important. And I think the reason why I'm going this way is because I want you to think about knowing God 
in a completely different way today. That's my goal, is you can walk out of here and understand your relationship with God in an entirely different way than maybe you've never thought of before. So I'm going to take you all the way back to when I was a little kid, all right? And growing up, I grew up on a farm. It was an amazing place. And on, growing up on the farm, we had these tracked radios, right? Radios around. Radio was a big deal. We had four TV channels, so radio was a big deal for us. Um, we had WNAX. We got that. We listened to that. And we also have, uh, it's, in here it's called 1060 KGFX. And on both those radio stations, they would broadcast, that's right, Minnesota Twins Baseball, all right? Minnesota Twins Baseball. So when I was a little kid, we used to listen to that all the time. And when I was nine years old, 1987, the Minnesota Twins, for the very first time, won the World Series, right? And, and remember, Curry Pocket, Kent Herbeck, I've seen all the people smiling. They're my Twins fans. They're my people right there, right? That was awesome. I loved it. I was a huge Minnesota Twins fan from that moment to this day. I still love the Minnesota Twins. And, and so I'm telling you this story because one day, so again, I lived on a farm, and the two big towns around us were Pierce, South Dakota, about an hour away, and Aberdeen, which is about an hour and 20 minutes away. So if you want to do something, you either went to Pierce or Aberdeen. That was your two choices, right? So we went to Aberdeen as a family one time, and we're walking around in the Aberdeen Mall, okay? And, and we're just walking around, hanging out. Now, again, I want to pause here for a second. How many of you in this room have older siblings? Raise your hand. Okay? Older siblings. You have older siblings. All right? Keep them up. And I want you to rate, keep them up if you have an older sibling that ever messed with you. All right? They did something that wasn't very nice. And it kind of did best. Okay, you guys, right? Look around. If you're an older sibling right now, repent. Okay? Look at that. Okay, you put your hands down. Okay. So I was the youngest. And I had two older sisters. All right? So remember, I'm walking around the mall in Avenue, South Dakota. My two sisters come running up to me, like, just fast as they can, passionately run up to me, and they go, Jack, 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 Gary Gaetti is here in the mall. Now, that name might not mean anything to you guys, but Gary Gaetti was my all-time favorite Minnesota Twin. All right? He played third base for the Twins, and he, uh, he wore number eight. It was my op. So they're like, Gary Gaetti is here in the Aberdeen American Mall. And I said what any little sibling would have done at that point. Yeah, right. Right? I'm like, you guys are totally messing with me. I said, if you really wanted to get me, you should have picked like a lesser twin. Like, don't pick my favorite twin. I'm not going to fall for this. You guys are full of junk. All right? Now, true story. Um, I was talking, my parents are in town today. I was talking with them about this story last night. And they don't actually remember this. But, um, so I got my, my older sister, I got her on the phone. And, and she remembered <laughs> the story. And so she confirmed that this is a 100% true story, right? And uh, she also told me to say that she was very smart, beautiful, and intelligent. So there you go, Susan. If you're watching online, I just said that. Uh, all right. So back to the story. All right. I don't believe them. We're in the mall. Your favorite Minnesota twin is going to be in the mall. And so finally, I'm just like, fine. Just to shut you guys up, I'm going to go with you. I know this isn't true. I know this is fixed. So whatever you got planned, I'm going to blow it. So we're going to walk through the mall, and we're going to go see that Gary Gaetti is not in the mall. So we come around the corner. And in the Avenue Mall, when you come around this, on the far like west side, um, there's this hallway, there's a sports, sporting goods shop, and then there's a door that goes into Walmart, because Walmart was attached there. When you come around the corner, there's a line from the sporting goods shop all the way into Walmart. And guess who's sitting at the table in front of the shop? <laughs> Gary Gaetti. And I just like start freaking out, all right? Now again, you might not be a baseball fan, all right? But picture this, the person that you like idolize, right? Maybe it's a singer, maybe it's a movie star. They're sitting right there. And you can get in line to go see them and see them. And I was just ecstatic. I started freaking out. And so I'm like, oh, cool. Now I wanted to have something to sign, right? Because I want to get his autograph. Well, of course, I don't have anything because we weren't planning on this. This wasn't part of the plan. We had no idea this was happening. So my dad, actually, he went in the sporting goods shop and he brought me a baseball and actually brought it here. So this is my Gary Gaetti autographed baseball. I still have it like 30 years later. The ball is probably worth more than the signature. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, he's not a very good player. But I got to meet Gary Gaetti. I got to hand this ball to him and I was like, and he signed it and he handed it back to me. It was awesome. It was so cool. What does that got to do with anything? <laughs> Here's my point. How much more should we be excited about being God? Amen. 
how much more the God of the universe, who created all things and holds all things in his hand, how much more in awe of him should we be when we come into the presence of God? And if that happens, if you really know God, friends, there's some things that are going to happen. So I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 6. And I'm going to tell you a story about a guy who had that exact experience. His name was Isaiah. He was a prophet who lived back in a very difficult time. And up until this point in Isaiah's life, he had a lot of questions for God. He asked God a lot of things. He said, I don't understand this, God. I don't understand this. In Isaiah chapter 6, something really cool happened. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. Two wings covered their faces, two covered their feet, and the two were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah stood in the presence of God Almighty. And when that happens, friends, there are two things, and in your notes, I want you to write these down. There are two things, two truths in life, that when you truly know God, two things are going to happen. And you'll never be the same. Here's the first one. You will love unconditionally. You will love unconditionally. See, the reality is most people have a lot of conditional love for God. I have this hat sitting there. In case you're wondering what this is, I think that a lot of times we like to have God like a hat that we put on. I love God. God is awesome. I love God. Oh, but wait a minute. I don't really want to go to church right now. Or I, I love God. God is great. Oh, but, but you want me to forgive him for what? No, not going to do that. How about this? Oh, I love God. I love God. I want to, I want to serve God. I want to be there. Oh, but you're in church. You're going to talk about tithing? I don't, I, I don't want that. It's that buffet way of Christianity. We pick and choose. See, when we love God, we will love, when we know God truly, we will love God without conditions. Look at what happened to Isaiah. When he truly saw God, and when you truly know God, this is what happens in your life. Isaiah verse 5 says, Woe to me. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. I, my eyes have seen the King and the Lord God Almighty. See, when we truly see God, we can't have a consumer mindset. All we do is fall on our face and say, God, I'm not worthy. God, I don't deserve this. I, I am ruined. I am completely destroyed because of your presence and because of your love. Because we're sinful people. And when we see that, when we truly recognize how much we needed the cross of Jesus Christ, it's going to change everything about us. Look at what happened in verse 6. And this is a symbol, I want you to understand. This is a symbol of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphims flew to me with a live coal in his, mouth, in his hand, which he had taken for tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth, and he said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. Your sin has been atoned for. I don't know where you're at right now in your life. I don't care what you've done or what you think you've done. Welcome home. God loves you. He has forgiveness for you. When we stand in the presence of God, just like when I stood in the presence of Gary Gaddy, again, just to bring it back to that, I wasn't afraid of him. I, 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 just, I was in awe of him. I was in value of him. I realized that I was just a little pointy peon you know, wanting to get a baseball sign. And that's what we can sense with God. But how cool would it have been if Gary Gaddy would have looked at me and he would have said, hey, kid, he said, hey, I'm kind of hungry. You want to run down to the, the, the lunch counter down there and grab me some food and a hamburger and bring it back to me? You know what I would have done? I'd have been like, yeah. <laughs> I, I would have done it, right? Because that would have been exciting for me. I wouldn't be afraid of it. I, 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 would have, I would have loved to have done that for him. Or if he would have said to me something like, hey, hey, Jeff, you know, we're kind of short on bat boys up in, you know, tar uh, the Twins. You want to come be a bat boy for a while in Minnesota? I would have been like, oh, yeah, <laughs> let's go do it, right? And that's what happens when we're in God's presence. See, we, we're not going to be afraid of God. It's not that we're in fear of him. It's just we see that there's a gap between us and God and that nothing we can do to ever cover that gap. That's why Jesus did it for us. That's why God came down to us. And then our response to other people is to love without conditions. 
I, I love everyone in this room. And, and I can't, I don't put conditions on that because I can't. Because of what God has done for me. Here's the second thing that you will do. You will love unconditionally, but you will live completely changed. See, when you really know God and you really experience God, your life will never be the same. Now, does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. Are you still going to make mistakes? Oh, yeah. Are you still going to blow it? Absolutely. But you know what? You're going to be a lot quicker to make it right. You're going to be a lot quicker to try to fix it and whatever needs to be done. And some of the greatest conversations that I have is, is people will say things like this to me. Pastor, I know that I really shouldn't do this. But for some reason, I just keep doing it, and I feel really guilty about it. You know what my response is always? At least you know it's wrong. Because <laughs> a month ago or a year ago, maybe you did it without even thinking about it. And, and you didn't have any thoughts about it at all. That shows progress in our life. See, that means our life is changing towards God and becoming more and more like Him. We can't go back. We've been changed. We're driven by a new mission. We've been given a new heart, and God is honoring that. Look at what Isaiah said. All right, let's do this. Isaiah 6, 8. Um, this is what God says to Isaiah. And this verse, guys, if you want to memorize a verse, this is a great verse to put up on your refrigerator. If you ever come in my office, I have a beautiful plaque that my wife made for me before I moved down here. It's got this verse on it, and it's got a big map of Yankton in our area. Because many of you know, God didn't just call me Yankton. I'm called to this area to plant churches and to grow God's kingdom. That's what we're supposed to do. But this is what God said. I heard a voice from the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And here's what Isaiah said. Here I am, send me. See, when God asks a question, you say yes. Now, before you even know the question, you say I'm in. I'm going to do whatever it takes, God, to get there. See, Isaiah didn't like sit back and go, okay, like, what are the terms and conditions? What, you know, what, what, what's the retirement plan? How much is this in it for me? Isaiah, Isaiah stood in the presence of God. He knew God. He saw God in an amazing way. He knew that he would love unconditionally. He knew that he was, didn't deserve what he had been given to him. But now his life was forever changed. When you truly see God, and you fully know God truly, you will stand up and you will shout, Here I am, son of me. Here I am, God. Send me. I want to do this. And friends, that's what's happened in my life. And, and, and I, I say this because, again, I love you guys. But I've really been in prayer about this. There is absolutely nothing unique about a landmine. There's absolutely nothing unique about a landmine. Since we moved here to Yankton, we've worked, both worked 40 hours a week. We both have kids. We both have a family. We both have extended family. We both have a wife. But there's something different. And we are completely obsessed with one thing, and that is furthering God's kingdom and reaching as many people as we possibly can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everything that you guys see is a result of that. And, and, and again, it's not that there's something unique or special about us. I, I'm convinced any person in this room could have done what Elaine and I have done the last two years. Absolutely, 100%, I can prove it to you. In fact, I know some of you, some of you could have done it better than me. I could have done it, all right? But what would it look like if every single one of us lived our lives completely sold out to that call? That says, God, here I am, send me. I'll say yes, now what was the question? I, I don't want to have a buffet relationship with God where I just pick and choose the things that I like and the things I don't like. I want to be completely sold out to God in every single way possible that, he, that I can imagine and, and, and be there. Because if you do that, you'll never be the same. There's so many people um, that have known me since I've been here in Yankton. And I've heard this multiple times over the course of the past two months where they have said, Jeff, there is something completely different about you. And that's even just in the two years that they've known me. And I can say absolutely it's true. I hope every single follower of Jesus Christ gets to pastor a church at some point. Now, that doesn't mean I think everybody should be a pastor. Don't hear that. What I'm saying is it has completely changed my relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I, I thought I had it pretty well figured out. I thought I was doing pretty good. And, and since we've been down here, man, I've just been stripped down. Stripped down bare in so many different areas of my life. And, and God has revealed things that I, I, I hadn't even known in my own heart. 
that I had to deal with, that I had to walk through, that I had to go through. And, and, and guys, I am so obsessed right now in a way that I've never felt before that how God has positioned us as a church, how, how God has put people in this church in certain positions and areas that we can continue to grow God's kingdom in a phenomenal way. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I believe God is about ready to blow the lid off this community in a way that has never happened probably in a generation. And I'm okay saying that. And, and I'm going to keep saying that. That's because I think what we really need to do is we really need to understand who God is. And we really need to know Him. And we really need to get in His presence and understand that when we're in God's presence, how much of a gap there is between God and I. And how much He loved us and Jesus covered that. And so I'm going to ask you right now to have a reality check in your own life. Do you really know God? Do you really understand what it means to God? Because here's a verse in Matthew 7. And this verse, and I mean this, it literally scares the hell out of me. And I mean that exactly how I said it. Jesus said this, not me, in Matthew 7. He said, many on that day, many on that day will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I, didn't I do this? Lord, didn't I go to church? Lord, Lord didn't I give to the church? Lord, didn't I serve the church? Lord, didn't I do all these things for you? And you know what Jesus is going to say? This is Jesus' words, not mine. He says, depart from me. I never even knew you. Friends, as your pastor, that verse has had me in tears more than any verse. Because I don't want anyone in this church to be part of that many. I want everyone to fully know and understand that there is a God who loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not out to get you. He's not sitting there with a the lightning bolt waiting to strike you. He loves you enough to die on the cross for you. And so what could we possibly have against our fellow man in that case? How could I ever be angry with someone else when God has done for me what he's done for me? And if I can be in that much awe of a baseball player, how much more should I be in the presence of my God Almighty and, and understand what he's done for me and how it should completely change my life? I am completely obsessed with building God's kingdom as much as I can be and bring as many people along as I can. How are you doing with that, church? What does that look like in your life? Let's pray. God, you know how much I wrestled with this message this week. And even now, as, as we're wrapping this up, I beg you, if there was any part of Jeff Todd in that, I want you to strike it from the minds and the hearts of the people that heard what I just said. And I want it to be fully you, God. Because I want, you, I want everyone in this church to understand fully, God, what that means and how it is to be in your presence. And God, when we enter your presence, our lives will be completely changed. We'll be forever ruined. And we will love without conditions. Because God, we've got work to do. And there's so many people in this community who don't yet know you. God, they have faces, they have names. Some of them are coworkers. Some of them are our neighbors. Some of them are our family. Oh, Jesus, break our hearts for that. That we can see that we on our own have nothing to offer them. But oh, the Lord who loves them has so much on to offer them. And God, we do little things and we expect a pat on the back for them. We show up an hour early and help unload a trailer. And we think, for some reason, we think you're going to be proud of us for doing that. God, that's the least we can do. God, we're, we're going to go down at this riverboat days and we're going to drive a little kitty train and, and, and love on people. And God, help us not to pat ourselves on the back for that, Lord. Just help us to see that as, man, this is all I can do. Why, why wouldn't I want to share God's love with people? Why wouldn't I want to help other people experience the same freedom and the same love that you've shown me, God? God, thank you so much that you love us and that you show us that grace. And that we, every single person in this room, can have access to you and to know you fully.